Um, Amos chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. The book of Amos chapter 6. If you have your Bible, which I hope you do, grab your Bible, turn to Amos chapter 6. I'm going to read verse 1 all the way through uh, verse 7 to start us out this morning. It says this, What sorrow awaits you who lounge in luxury? You can, you can underline that. What sorrow awaits you who lounge in luxury in Jerusalem and you who feel secure in Samaria? You are famous and popular in Israel and people go to you for help. But go over to Kalna and see what happened there. Then go to the great city of Hamath and down to the Philistine city of Gath. You're no better than they were. And look at, look at how they were destroyed. You push away every thought of coming disaster, but your actions only bring the day of judgment closer. How terrible for you who sprawl on ivory beds and lounge on your couches, eating the meat and tender lambs from the flock and of the choice and of choice calves fattened in the stall. You sing trivial songs to the sound of uh, the harp and fancy yourselves to be great musicians like David. You drink wine by the bowlful and perfume yourselves with fragrant lotions. You care nothing about the ruin of your nation. Therefore, you will be the first to be led away as captives. Suddenly, all your parties will end. I, I entitled the message today, Amos and the Party Poopers. Amos and the Party Poopers, which right after I wrote that down for the first time, I was like, this is a, this is a great band name. Amos and the Party Poopers. Today, what I'd like to do, I want to talk about the dangers of Christian complacency. The dangers of Christian complacency. And uh, let me tell you, we're actually going to be doing communion at the very end of the message today. So maybe you can send somebody to grab elements um, right after, you know, in about 30 minutes or so, we're going to respond uh, with communion. And so I want to talk about Christian complacency. The reason why is because, listen, there's no denying it, right? We live in this world that, uh, or we live in this culture, we live in this time that offers a sense of satisfaction and certainly security in many ways. And there is this temptation for us to uh, become complacent in our faith. There's a temptation for us to walk with this like divided heart where, where, you know, we believe in God, we worship God, we go sing, we do the song and dance on Sunday, but then we rely on the world to satisfy the cravings of our flesh. We, you know, we, we tiptoe the line, which, which as we see, as Amos shows us here is, is dangerous is destructive in many ways. And also, as we see, as we're going to study and break down this passage, the only way to true satisfaction, hear me, the only way uh, to lasting joy, lasting peace, lasting security is found, in, uh, is found through wholehearted devotion to God. That's it. It's all about God. It's our hearts postured towards God. And so you, you actually get back to the text. What we see is that this was uh, the year 760 BC, so right around you know uh, seven and a half centuries before Jesus. And Amos, who was this guy, he was a shepherd in uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. He's called out by God to prophesy over the northern kingdom of Israel, which was a place uh, at the time uh, on its surface was a place that looked super impressive for many different reasons. One, they had a king who was just incredibly successful, uh, who built this massive army, this massive military. Uh, and so they were a superpower. They, they had walls around their capital city of Samaria that were you know, strong and that were fortified. They won all these battles, lots of battles against rival nations that would come up against them. And so what that meant was is that they accumulated uh, vast amounts of, of land and they uh, accumulated vast amounts of wealth. And so at the time, if you, were, if you were a leader in Israel, if you were in the upper class, if you were you know, in the elite, 
Israel, Samaria was the place to be. The capital city was safe. It was powerful. Uh, and it was prosperous in many ways. But there was, there was one problem. And this is where Amos and his message uh, to the northern kingdom of Israel and his message to the southern kingdom of Judah comes in. That their prosperity had developed into uh, a sense of security that had taken the place of God. Their success, they relied so much on their success that they forgot about God. Once they were faithful to God, once there was this generation who was relying upon God, who was devoted to Yahweh and, uh, and His law and His uh, direction and instruction, but now they'd become obsessed with wealth. Obsessed with their luxury, as it says in verse 1. What sorrow awaits you who lounge in luxury or, you know, uh, you, know uh, you feel secure, you're famous, you're popular, people are going to you. They were obsessed with their wealth, obsessed with uh, material possessions. These were the people who, who built mansions. You read back through the Old Testament. They built these mansions. They built these winter homes, these summer homes. They planted these lush vineyards. They slept on ivory beds, it says, that they lounged on the fanciest furniture. They weren't, you know, shopping in Ikea. You know, they, they, were, they ate the finest foods. They drank the finest, most expensive wine. And they, you know, consumed the greatest perfume. And so these people were obsessed. They were addicted to their comfort and to their luxury. They looked good. They felt good. They smelled good. They also became experts at self-care where, you know, they, they put themselves and their needs above everybody else. Uh, which, you know, it was all for the sake of power. It was all for the sake of control. This meant that they totally neglected the poor, where God called them to love on the poor, to show mercy towards the poor, to help the poor. They neglected the poor. They rejected the oppressed. Uh, they, they imposed these higher taxes on the poor in order to fill their own pockets full of more money. They... Uh, accepted bribes in many ways. They deprived the poor of justice. They deprived the poor of any sort of legal representation. They condoned slavery in many ways. And so these people, not only were they obsessed with their wealth and their luxury and their material possessions, but they were prideful. They were arrogant. Uh, they, they were uh, corrupt. They, they basically treated themselves as the kings and queens in their own kingdom. Which, which all led to this deep level of idolatry where once there was this wholehearted devotion and worship to God, now it was all half-hearted ritual where God was just one of the many gods, where Yahweh was compartmentalized, where they, they continued to, to worship they continued to sing like David. They, they continued to, you know, they went to church. They, they paid their tithe. They offered their sacrifices and, and their many different offerings. They, they did the song. They did the dance. But they also worshipped all these other gods. Like they, they built these altars and, and they built these temples to worship these Canaanite gods who offered all different types of temporal pleasure and satisfaction for the flesh. Like, you know, the gods of sex and prosperity and weather and war and all these types of gods. And so overall, you can see like the upper class in Israel, they were partying. Uh, you know, the wine was flowing. Uh, the food was being consumed, the music was bumping, they were rich, they were powerful, they were comfortable, and they were complacent in their faith. They had become secure and content, uh, indifferent in their faith. Uh, they were content with their unrighteous lifestyle. And, and you see, that's the reason why Amos was sent to these guys, uh, to warn God's people, both Israel and Judah, that, that God wouldn't tolerate complacency. That in the kingdom of God, there's no room for pride. That there's no room for idolatry. That there's no room for self-satisfaction. He actually reaffirms it if you go to verse 8. In Amos chapter 6, second half of verse 8, he says, Look, I despise the arrogance of Israel. And I hate 
their fortresses, all these things that they've built for themselves, all of their possessions. I will give this city and everything in it to their enemies. In fact, if you go back uh, a chapter, so if you go back to Amos verse, uh, chapter 5, starting in verse 21, he reinforces this again. Uh, this is the Lord saying, he says, look, I hate all your show and your pretense. The hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings or uh, and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, instead, here's what I want from you. I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. In other words, God's saying, look, you, you may be comfortable. You may think that you're powerful. You may think that you're secure, but listen, you're not immune on the day of judgment. That, that divine destruction, as he says, I'm going to give this city and everything in it to their enemies. Divine destruction is coming to those who are proud, to those who are arrogant, to those who are self-centered, who are indifferent in their faith, who hope in their own you know, prosperity and their possessions and their own power. But there's a divine favor and there's divine blessing from heaven reserved for those who humble themselves before God, who wholeheartedly and sincerely honor and worship and surrender themselves to God, who value others, check this out, others before they value themselves who serve and love others as God first and served loved them first loved and served them who who care for the poor who care for the oppressed who stand for justice and who live uh, righteously who live in in right standing with God this was the message that Amos gave to the people of Israel and the people of Judah here this was the warning the bad news if you continue on the story and what we know as we see through scripture, the bad news is the leaders, they totally ignored the message. They didn't listen to Amos. They didn't listen to God. They, they stayed complacent. They stayed unrepentant. And within 40 years of hearing this message, uh, just as God said he was going to do, the nation of Assyria, the Assyrians came in and attacked uh, Samaria and uh, led God's people back to Assyria in exile. And so, you know, the pomp and the circumstance and the, um, I think I said that right, pomp and circumstance, the, the party, the music, the fun, the entertainment, uh, it was all gone. It was over. It was finished. They had encountered the divine judgment of God. Now, listen. I know that, um, I don't know, I, I'm not really, I wasn't super familiar with this story. Maybe you were familiar with the story, uh, who knows. I, it is an interesting story, right? Um, but the question is like how, do, like, how do we apply this message? Or what is the message here? Like I know the message for Israel as God spoke through the prophet Amos, but what's the message for you and for me? Well, well, here's what we do know as we see through Scripture is that this message, it, it, it's a reminder that it ultimately transcends the Old Testament and speaks directly to us and our circumstance and our heart that in the kingdom of God, there is no place for Christian complacency. I want to say that again because take note of that. This is so important that in the kingdom of God, there's no place for Christian complacency. There's no such thing as being a complacent Christian. There's no room for half-hearted devotion, for uh, self-centered uh, satisfaction, for pride, or for indifference in our faith. And I don't know about you, but that, that kind of rattles me a little bit. It kind of shakes me up a little bit because, you know... Uh, in many ways, like ancient Israel, I would say that we live in a time, in a place, and in a culture that looks pretty impressive, right? I mean, we're, we're rich and we're comfortable. You may not think so, but you're rich. Uh, we, you know, we live in one of, if not the wealthiest nation in the entire world. I read, uh, I read a statistic the other day that said that if you made $25,000 uh, last year, you're considered... Um, to be in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world. I read another uh, 
statistics that say if you made if you made fifty thousand dollars last year, which applies to some people, if you made fifty thousand dollars last year, uh, you are considered to be in the upper echelon, uh, in the top one percent of the wealthiest, richest people in the entire world. Can we just put that in perspective for a second? That you know we have. We've been blessed with the resources and the ability to obtain money in America, to obtain comfort, to obtain luxury in many ways. Anything we want, anything we desire, it's at our fingertips. It's one click away. Think about, you know, you can go online with one click, with, you know, with one flick of the finger, uh, you know, there's food, there's clothing, there's furniture, anything we want, it's delivered right to our door. Uh, or, you know, we go into our favorite store, we go into Target, we go into REI, we go into uh, the mall, and with a plastic card out of our wallet, we can basically buy whatever we want. You know, we're rich. We're, we're comfortable in many ways. And also, like Israel, we're, we're not only rich and comfortable uh, and prosperous, uh, but we're a superpower. Like, like, you know, we're highly educated. We, uh, you know, uh, we're heavily resourced. We have a military who's strong, who's equipped, who's trained to serve and to protect and to uh, defend our basic freedoms as Americans. And so, uh, you know, like ancient Israel, on the surface, we look impressive. Like, life is good, right? Relatively speaking, we're prosperous. We're powerful, we're safe, we're comfortable, but also like Israel, here's what we need to understand is that with this prosperity, with this uh, power, comes this great temptation to grow complacent in our faith. In other words, you know, uh, we'll put our hope, um, our hope isn't found in God as much as it's, you know, tempting to find our hope in our income or our job or our retirement or, you know, our time, our energy, our resources, our achievements. Or, you know, our dependency isn't found in the promises and the mercy and the grace of God, but more in our uh, possessions and more in our food and, and uh, our entertainment and, you know, that physical relationship that we're in or our preferences and our needs. And so subtly, without, without maybe even realizing it, we've become like half-hearted, complacent Christians lounging around on our furniture, consuming and depending upon all this stuff, all of our possessions, all of, you know, everything for our needs and for our satisfaction, where we're the kings and we're the queens of our own kingdom. We care more about our stuff. And we care more about ourselves than we do about God or about anybody else that God has called us to care about. Which is, man, let me tell you, this is like dangerous, poisonous territory, right? For a couple different reasons. One is that, you know, Jesus tells us uh, in the book of Matthew, he says, look, the things of this world, they're all going to pass away. Like the things that you earn, the, these possessions that you have, this technology, it's, it's all fragile. It's all temporal. It's not what's going to get you to heaven. You're not going to be able to take it. I, I heard this pastor say a couple months ago that no one takes a U-Haul to their own funeral. Like you can't take anything with you. The things of this world are, are temporal. They're fragile. At the same time, listen, God's not going to share his throne and he's not going to share your heart with anyone or anything else. God is a jealous God. One of the words of God, or one of the names for God is jealous. He's jealous because he loves you. He's jealous because he made you. He's jealous because he created and he's purposed you and he offers you salvation. He offers you security and satisfaction that only comes through wholehearted devotion to him and to him alone. And so it's all fragile. Everything that we're tempted to, to put our devotion in, uh, you know, apart from God, it's all going to fail us. Um, and God's not going to share his throne. Jesus, he reinforces this warning as he rebukes um, the church in Laodicea in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. Turn with me there. Chapter 3. Uh, of Revelation. It's the last book in Scripture. It says this in verse 15. This is Jesus speaking, the resurrected King. He says, look, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot 
nor cold. In other words, you have become half-hearted, complacent Christians with a foot in the world and a foot in with God. You're on the fence. You're playing the center. Your heart is divided. He says, I wish that you were one or the other, but since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. He's saying, look, your, your, your apathetic, your indifferent song and dance, it's sick. Your, your Sunday morning worship routine online or in person, or your Sunday morning worship, your Monday self-gratification and satisfaction in many ways, it's gross. It's disgusting. It's hypocritical. It's dishonoring. It's useless to me. He says in verse 17, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. In other words, your, your prosperity, your possessions, your power, it's all an illusion. It's all of this facade, right? That on the surface, you may feel satisfied for a little while. On the surface, you may, you know, feel comfortable in some way, but deep down, you search your soul deep down because of your sin against God. You are broken, you are empty, and you are vulnerable, completely helpless, powerless, and ineffective. So he says in verse 18, as a response, he says, look, so I advise you, like here's my, here's my encouragement to you. I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. I've done the work. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me, Jesus. So you will not be shamed by your nakedness and an, an, anoint, an ointment for your eyes. So you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Be diligent and turn from your indifference. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, uh, I know you're searching. Uh, I know you're hungry. I know you're thirsty for fulfillment and deep satisfaction. I have what you are longing for. I have what you're searching for. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry. Anyone who uh, drinks from me will never be thirsty. I have done the work. I have been refined. I, I have died on the cross for the sins of the world, for your sin, both past, present, and future. I rose to new life three days later, defeating sin and defeating death in the grave to give you the opportunity through faith and through trust to have everlasting life uh, reconciled to the Father, both starting right now and lasting for eternity. I'm offering you eternal peace. I'm offering you eternal comfort, eternal satisfaction, eternal rest, but it requires repentance. It requires turning from the things that you uh, are dependent upon. It requires a whole heart pointed towards me, postured in my direction. He says, turn from your indifference. Turn from your complacency. Uh, turn, uh, uh, turn and follow me. Jesus didn't call his disciples and say, look, um, all you got to do is believe in me. All you got to do is uh, give me a little bit of money. All you got to do is, uh, you know, um, uh, be nice to me or be a friend to me or whatever. No, he said, look, you follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Follow me, emulate me, surrender your life to me. In fact, Amos chapter five, if you go back, chapter five, starting at verse four, and then again at verse six, he, he gives them an opportunity to respond. He says, look, seek me, this is the Lord speaking, seek me and live. Seek the Lord and live. In other words, don't, don't rely on uh, this, you know, the, these, this false religion. Don't rely on politics or power or achievements or all these other gods. Don't, don't depend upon, you know, your stuff. 
and your luxury and your opulence or your possessions or that relationship or your education or you know your pride don't depend on all these things everything that you know you know is easily at your fingertips you seek me jesus says you seek me be content in me trust me depend upon me and you will live you have abundant life in fact jesus says uh, in matthew 6 verse 33 he says uh, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things uh, will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Uh, I say all this, and uh, I'm preaching to myself here, you know. And um, I'll say that I do worry. You know, I, I think there, there is a worry as your pastor. There's a worry that there are people watching this right now um, who have become complacent in their faith and who are banking on the fact that when they reach their last day and they're standing before the Lord at his, uh, at his feet in his throne room and they cry out to the Lord, 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 I'm afraid for some of us that God's going to answer back and say, I never knew you. Like, you did the church thing, you checked it all off the box, you did all these things in my name, but you were complacent in your faith. You believed in me, um, but you never truly received me as your Lord. You had one foot in church and one foot in the world. And really your satisfaction and your delight and um, your fulfillment, it didn't come from me, it came from the things of this world. I never knew you. And so the challenge, the challenge I think for all of us is, man, where is our dependency and where is our satisfaction coming from? What am I depending on apart from God uh, for soul satisfaction and for soul security? Uh, I'll end with this story. I, my wife and I, we've been to Burkina Faso, Africa, maybe, uh, uh, I think three times now, three or four times. And uh, I gotta tell you, like the first trip to Burkina Faso, Africa, which is this third world country uh, on the western side of Africa, our first trip there with Monterey Church, we go with Compassion, um, one of our partner ministries. Um, I noticed two things specifically about uh, the Burkina B people, uh, specific, more specifically about the Christians in Burkina Faso, our brothers and sisters, spirit-filled Christians on the other side of the planet. Two things I noticed. One is that they were extremely poor, like beyond poor. Like they lived in uh, mud, mud huts, like legit, just, you know, mud walls um, with like straw as roof, as a rooftop. They uh, went to the bathroom in just holes in the ground, um, like in the corner of their house. Um, they, uh, they had little to no education, little to no technology, they had nothing. But at the same time, they, the second thing I noticed is that they, uh, they encountered incredible joy. These were the most joyful people I think I've ever met. Uh, contagious joy, heavenly joy. And, you know, I walked away from my first trip just asking myself, well, why? Like, how are these people so full? How are these Christians so full of joy? And I got to tell you, I think one of the reasons why is because they have nothing uh, uh, to distract them from God. Right? They have uh, nothing, nothing in front of them to make them complacent in their faith. Nothing for them to depend upon for some sort of satisfaction. All they have is God. Uh, 
They have this wholehearted devotion. They're completely content to God and to His Word and to His purposes and to His promises over them. And as they, you know, gave themselves over to God in that way, God provided for them. He gave them peace. He gave them comfort. He gave them whatever they needed. And they found so much joy in that. And listen, friends, I, I, I think in our world, in our culture, in all culture and context, this is so challenging to me because we have so much in the way right? We have so much to distract us from God. And so, man, my prayer and my hope and my challenge is that we would search our heart and that we would truly find those things in our heart that is separating us from God. Find those things in our heart that we're relying on, that we're dependent upon, uh, uh, that we, you know, that we put our trust in that is not of God where we've been complacent in our faith and may we turn to God and as we do so, He'll bless, He'll favor, He'll, uh, he'll give us heaven on earth starting right now and lasting forever.